Cognitive Neuroscience Bite Size. University of Sussex with Jamie Ward, author of The Student's Guide to Cognitive Neuroscience and The Student's Guide to Social Neuroscience. In today's Cognitive Neuroscience Bite Size, we're going to consider attention and how this is implemented in the brain. Attention is the mechanism for selecting information for further processing and discarding other information that perhaps is less relevant. So the brain can only process certain information at once. We can say that there's a limited capacity to our attentional window. But also this is an advantageous thing. We want to be able to select and prioritise some information at the expense of others. A good example of attention comes from change blindness. So here we have two still images that are alternating. The image of the boat at the back has a box that is disappearing and reappearing, but you don't notice it at first, perhaps until I cue you to that. But the fact that when I cue you, you can see it, shows that this is not a problem with visual perception. Your visual system can see it once it's attended to it. The problem was focusing and selecting that relevant information in the first place from a clustered scene. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball. Another example of attention uh, operating like this is um, the, the famous gorilla experiment where people are counting basketball um, passes from one group of players to another. If your attention is diverted to uh, counting basketball passes, then you don't notice a, gr a gorilla who enters the scene, bangs his chest and walks off. So about 50% of people do notice the gorilla and 50% of people don't. But when their attention is um, oriented towards the grill, if you tell people not to count the basketball players, 100% of people will notice this. So again, this is a phenomenon related to attention rather than perception. So although we call these things change blindness and inattentional blindness, they're not really blindness. This is not a problem with our visual system. It's rather a limited capacity of our attention system that is selecting one information above another. It's focusing on the uh, basketball players to such extent that you're almost blind. You can't uh, notice or report the, the presence of the gorilla. We can think of uh, attention in terms of a spotlight metaphor, that we're highlighting certain parts of a scene at the expense of others. And we can move this spotlight around either strategically, we can choose to move it, or maybe it moves of its own free will. If something flashes in the corner, then the spotlight gets attracted to it. So attention often is seen as a, a spatial metaphor, that we highlight certain parts of the scene at, at the expense of others. But there are also non-spatial aspects of attention. So in this image, we can see both a scene and a, a person's face superimposed on each other. So here, you've got two things in the same place. But your attention can flick from one to the other. And you can choose to do that. Or if you just stare at this, then eventually one will come out uh, as more noticeable than the other. And it will flip over time as your attention waxes and wanes. What is going on in the brain when you're attending to, to one thing than another? In the example of the superimposed faces and houses, what we find is that within the visual ventral stream there are specialised areas for processing faces versus processing places such as houses. And when we attend to one stimulus, the bold activity goes up in the relevant area. So if we're attending to faces, bold activity in the face area goes up. Whereas when we're attending to places, bold activity in the place area goes up. So attention is linked to increased activity in specialised systems of the brain. What is it that increases this activity? Well, in this instance, it's coming from other parts of the brain, such as the parietal lobes, and which are ultimately connected to, connected to the, uh, the frontal lobes. So we've got this system of um, places and faces in the visual ventral stream, plus other higher order areas in the parietal lobes, which are then processing or selecting one of these two options. So what exactly
exactly is it that the parietal lobe is doing when it directs attention to one stimulus over and above another? We can look at the response properties of neurons in this part of the brain through single cell recordings of the activity of neurons. What we find is that neurons within the parietal lobe respond to visual information and auditory information, other kinds of uh, sensory features, but it does so in a sparse way. That is, it doesn't respond to every aspect of a visual scene or every aspect of an auditory scene. Instead, what it does is it responds to particular aspects of the scene that might be important. So, for example, if a neuron is um, not expecting anything on the left side, but all of a sudden there's a flash on the left side, then this would activate neurons in the parietal lobe, whereas an expected stimulus might not do that, or a, a stimulus that is irrelevant and has been present for a long time. Similarly, if you're searching for red objects, then here your task is telling you to look for red. What we find is that neurons in the parietal lobe would respond more to red stimuli than to blue stimuli. But again, if the task changes to be searching for blue, then all of a sudden uh, the neurons would re respond more to blue. So again, it's as if the, the neurons within certain parts of the parietal lobe are acting as a filter. They're not just responding to colour, they're responding to the relevant colours uh, for a given task. And maybe it's the frontal lobe that is telling the parietal lobe which um, features are relevant for a particular task. So if you're searching uh, for tomatoes in a crowded market, you're going to be looking for red. We can say that the parietal lobe has something along the lines of a salience map. That is, it contains maps of the sensory world that highlight the most important or salient aspects of it. And this differs from uh, information within the, uh, the early visual system or the early auditory system, which um, codes all kinds of information and doesn't select strongly for one kind of information over another. Another difference between um, the vi visual coding of information in the parietal lobes versus early visual regions is that um, the left parietal lobe will respond to stimuli in both the left side of space and the right side of space, and the right parietal lobe will respond to stimuli in both the left and the right, so they have bilateral representations of space, whereas early visual regions um, only respond to the opposite hemifield. Although parietal lobes do have a bilateral representation of space, there's still a bias or asymmetry. So the right parietal lobe has a much stronger representation of the left side of the space than it does the right. What this means is if you damage the right parietal lobe, you have problems in attending to the left side of the space, but you're good at spotting things on the right side of the space. And this particular neuropsychological symptom is called neglect. So brain damage to the right parietal lobe means that you fail to notice things on the left side of the screen. So if you're asked to detect um, letter A's in a, an array of letters, you might notice the ones on the right side and ignore the ones on the left side. Or if you're asked to put makeup on, or uh, you might omit uh, putting lipstick on the left side of your face, or you might um, not eat food on the left side of your plate. Um, the, the left parietal lobes also has a bilateral representation, but the, the effects of damage to the left side are less severe. The right hemisphere seems to be particularly important for spatial representations in uh, humans uh, and creates this uh, asymmetrical effects of brain lesions to the parietal lobes. We would say that neglect is a disorder of attention rather than perception because if you cue the patients to stimuli on their left that they're missing, they will notice this. So if you point out a letter A that they'd missed, they'll say, oh, there it is. And this might seem strange, but of course, this is exactly the phenomenon that we've just described in people without brain damage, that you couldn't see the box on the boat until it was pointed out to you. It's just that people with neglect do this in a spatially specific way, that they have problems with one particular hemifield.